Barriers against fraud were important not only to prevent waste, but to preserve morale among those who were working hard to remain independent. Now, I want you to think about this quote and what happened to poor Americans in the last 30 years. Quote, nothing is more demoralizing to the struggling poor than the successes of the indolent. In other words, if you're a working poor and you get up every day and you go to a job that isn't all that much fun and you're out there trying very hard to uh, make a decent living and your cousin is sitting at home doing nothing, drinking every night and getting as much money as you are, the moral devastation as you try to teach your children to follow your path of sobriety and hard work while your cousin makes fun of you every day for being stupid when you could be gaming the system. Okay? Saying uh, it was an important quote, and I want you to listen to this. This is a very harsh quote. And I want you to think about all the nice people you know who've automatically given money to the homeless. It was important to quote, reform those mild, well meaning, tender hearted, sweet voiced criminals who insist upon indulging in indiscriminate charity. This was a reformer of the late 19th century. New York charity leader Josephine Lowell said, quote, the problem before those who would be charitable is not how to deal with a given number of the poor. It is how to help those who are poor without adding to their numbers and constantly increasing the evils they seek to cure. And what the modern welfare state said is, we're not going to worry about that. Anybody who shows up, take care of them. Here's the money. And the result was a system which has been, in human terms, devastating. And again, Alaska is the tragic American compassion. It's far and away the best single statement of this I've read and is a, I think, a, a work of, of epoch. I mean, it will, it will change the whole way we think about this. Now, for 350 years, reformers had a remarkably similar set of requirements and judgments about how to help the poor and the addicted and what would actually hurt rather than help. And it's very important to look at the lessons they set up and the codification, which we'll come back to, which Olasky made of them. The lessons of American history are, one, we should expect the welfare state to fail. Two, there is an historically proven model of American success with which we can replace the current failure. Now, let's move then, begin to look at that. And if you look at pillar two, which is personal strength, we're going to come right back to Alaska. There are three key aspects of personal strength in replacing the culture of poverty and violence. One, there are seven characteristics of personal strength that traditional reformers understood and applied. This is the Alaska model. Two, personal strength is ultimately spiritual and therefore private rather than governmental. And three, compassion requires your personal strength more than your money. And I'm going to come back to that one because it will put a little burden on all of us. Interestingly, Olasky said that the seven characteristics the 19th century reformers put together went, were from A to G and that they codified them that way. They said that, the, that, that you can literally set up a list of steps from A to G in how you think about helping the poor. A is for affiliation. Who is there out there who knows something about this person? Who can you... Uh, do they have a friend? Do they have a family? Do they have a neighbor? Who can rebond with them as a human being, which is what B is? B is for bonding. That if you decide you have to help this person because nobody they're affiliated with is helping them, then you need to have one person who truly gets to know them. And according to Alaska in the 19th century, we averaged one volunteer for every two poor people. We didn't just take your tax money and say, stay home, the welfare worker will take care of them. We said, and I'm going to come back to this, if you truly care, find somebody and help them. And the result was, the average poor person knew a middle class person. There was a relationship. We broke down the barriers. C is for categorization. Things like using work tests and background <coughs> checks to distinguish. For example, they routinely required everybody to work before they got fed. If you were homeless and you showed up at the door, you had to cut wood and you usually cut wood both for yourself and you cut wood for a widow woman uh, because you ought to have dignity. If you were a woman and you showed up, they often had a sewing room, very often next to a, 
uh, nursery area, so there's a place where you could watch your children while you did work. But their principle was, if you're not prepared to do some work, you're a bum. Why are we feeding you? Now, bum, I realize, is a politically incorrect term that will soon rival giraffe and other things, but, <laughs> but, but I want you to think about it. I mean, what, you go through Olasky's book, and over and over, they're prepared to categorize people, and they say to them, you want to help yourself, we'll be partners. You don't want to help yourself, I owe you nothing. And again, I mean, try sometime walking through a major city, and every homeless person walks up to him and say, I will give you $20 if you'll work for me for one hour. And just see what the reaction is. Say, I, I'm glad you're here. I have a job right this minute. Let's go. I'll pay you 20 bucks. Now, if they won't do it, why are you giving them a penny? What is your obligation to subsidize their addiction? And in fact, isn't that the least caring thing you could do? Let me get you off my mind. I'll feel better. You'll get, you'll get whatever drug you use. The fact that you may die isn't my problem. I did my thing. I gave you money. I'm a good person. And the reformers in the 19th century drove at that attitude very hard and said, that is false charity. That makes you feel good. It does not help the person. So what Morris Schechtman describes in Work Without a Net as, as caretaking rather than caring. The caretakers feel kind, fine about themselves. I did a good thing. The person they have supposedly cared for may die. It's not my fault. But you may die in the process, too, because I mean, there's been so many incidents of taking poor people, knocking on you, or asking for work, and then the next thing they do is kill you and rob you. There's some instance of that. But, but I, I would argue for most of us, we could find ways to help the poor that, that don't run that risk. I didn't suggest you take them home necessarily. Well, no, they knock on your door right. all the time. But you know, you, you're hesitant to let them in because, because of personal safety yeah. or the safety of your family. Yeah. You What's know, some of that? That's not the only element that we see in the, in the inner city, and, and the question is this, because what we're talking about is great in theory, but because we're an incentive-motivated civilization. Why don't you let me finish? I'm sorry. Good. Finish. Yeah, that's right. Uh, D is for discernment. And discernment is learning how to say no in the short run so as to produce the results. It's literally saying there are times you deliberately turn people down because you're trying to get a lesson across. You're trying to show them a different way of things. E is for employment. They required work from every able-bodied person, period. They thought it was inherent in being an, a, a human being. F is for freedom. In their mind, once you got into government programs, you were enslaved. And so they worked very, very hard to, to help people remain free uh, in a way that, that was powerful and effective. And finally, G is for God. That, that all of these, all of the systems emphasize the spiritual, not just the material. And said, you know, I mean, if you have no relationship, if you have no spiritual, they, they didn't necessarily emphasize a particular sect. But they said, if you don't pray, you have no spiritual life, you have no sense of a larger being than yourself, why shouldn't you be an addict? I mean, look how bleak your world is. And so there was a constant repetition. So if you take those, those, those seven, let me just re read them for one second, because I do think they're useful. In, uh, just as a set. Affiliation, bonding, categorization, discernment, employment, freedom, and God were the core of this. Now compare the Alaska 7 with the principles of the welfare state. Affiliation versus isolated individualism. Bonding versus impersonal bureaucracy. Categorization versus automatic maintenance. Just, just look at those to start with. In the 19th century, he said, who are you related to? In the 20th century, he said, oh, that would be an inappropriate question. After all, it's not the bureaucracy's business. Do you need a check or not? In the 19th century, he would have said, we are going to have a personal relationship, and we are going to try to help you, and we're going to get to know each other. In the 20th century, the, bar the bureaucrat has 200 families. They can't possibly get to know people individually. In the 19th century, there was a very deliberate categorization. Are you really capable of working? Should you really be helped? What kind of help should you get? How can we get you back on your feet? In the 20th century, you deserve AFDC. You deserve food stamps. Who are we to interfere? And again, the government can't interfere at this level because you'd have to be setting up virtually a dictatorship. There are other standards. Look at discernment versus automatic sympathy or employment versus no work requirement, freedom versus dependence or God versus indifference at best or hostility at worst to religion and spirituality. I mean, 
this, this gets so bad, Olasky tells a story of, of, of spending some time in Washington as a homeless person and ending up in a church basement at a breakfast, looking like a homeless person. He'd spent three or four days in the street. Uh, and he mumbled to the young lady who was serving breakfast, could he have a Bible? And she said, uh, do you want a bagel? Well, we have a bagel. Uh, and he said, no, no. He said, I want a Bible. And she said, we don't have any Bibles here. This was in the basement of a church. But he said, in the entire time he was homeless in Washington, there were plenty of places to sleep, plenty of places to eat, plenty of clothing. He did not once have a person talk to him about his spiritual life, about the need to somehow be saved from what he was going through, or about the notion that God mattered. Even though a great deal of the time he was in religious institutions. But they thought they, they had broken down so far from their traditional mission that they thought as long as they fed you, it didn't matter. 